Hi, everybody. I'm Jason Baker. I'm here to speak with uh, Stephen Clay Hunter and Max Sacker. We're here to talk about Dis uh, Disney Pixar's movie Out, which is the first movie by Pixar that features a gay lead character and has the first same-sex kiss. Um, it's also very important because it features an interracial relationship, uh, which is something that's very important to us. How are y'all doing today? Groovy. Good. How are you Good doing? to see you, Jason and everybody. Do y'all want to yeah. tell us a little bit about yourselves? Oh. Oh, geez. Um, it all started Max. many movies. <laughs> you go first, Max. You're always good at this. Uh, I, yeah. uh, my name is Max Sacker. I was the producer on Out. Um, I'm, uh, I'm born and raised here in San Francisco, where I currently live. And I've been at Pixar for uh, almost 14 years. I'll be celebrating my 14th year anniversary at Pixar uh, next week. Um, so I've worked on a range of films from Wally -E all the way through uh, throughout, and uh, yeah, good to be here. <laughs> um, my name's Steve Hunter. I'm the director of Out. Um, I'm originally from Canada, Channel, Ontario, and then I uh, moved to the Bay Area back in like around '93 or something, and started at Pixar in '97. So Max, I got you beat. <laughs> um, and I live here in Oakland, California. Perfect. Okay. So let, let's dive into this. What was the inspiration for Out? Um, I, it kind of went back to, um, you know, when they asked me if, they, if I had an idea for the short, the first thing that came to my mind was, um, you know, coming like a coming out story. It, I, I don't know what it was that drew me to it, but... Um, I, my, uh, my directing friend, um, Kristen Lester, who did, um, Pearl, she, I asked her like, how did you come up with, like, how do you come up with the ideas on this? And she said, I write down a themes that I'm interested in exploring in film on one side. And on the other side, I write down cool shit I want to see in a movie, you know, kind of thing. And so, um, so I did that and I wrote like, you know, a coming out story. And then I wrote like a boy and his dog. And then I wrote like the coming out story. And I wrote like, I don't know, tap dancing dinosaurs or some other weird thing. And then, um, and then, but every every theme kept coming back as a coming out thing, and I kind of, I kind of realized like quickly that I just it was something I needed to explore, you know, and talk about, because um, I like I said I'm I'm 51, I didn't come out till I was 27. That's like half my life, where I wasn't able to be who I wanted to be, fully. So, what are those feelings, and what do, what do I need to say and talk about? Um, was sort of where I was coming from. Okay. So I, when, I, when I watch out um, and, and I see Greg having his struggle, one thing that I'm kind of uh, find myself focusing on is, you know, they don't tell you that coming out is, that we, we have this perception that coming out is just like this magical event and then all of a sudden it's rainbows and unicorns and everybody knows who you are. But I kind of feel like it, that's not really how it works. I feel like gay people are constantly coming out of the closet. It, it, it's a continual struggle. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about that and maybe see how Greg might be coming out of the closet in the events after the show? Well, I think we're, I think we're just constantly, it's, it's a thing we're aware of, right? Because we've been in that space for so long that you come out to yourself, yay. And then you come out to your family, yay. And then you're at work and you're like, uh, and you get those weird little moments of weird conversations where you're like my boyfriend, you know, like there's a stutter stop that happens because your, your brain has been trained to like, oh, I gotta hide who I am, I gotta hide who I am. So that little voice is still in there even after all these years. So I feel like that's just this sort of like knee jerk kind of like um, behavioral reaction that we have because of that. And I think the more the more we tell these stories of ourselves, the more the less hopefully people will be forced to feel that way. Which is the whole reason we made this thing. I mean, it was really about, uh, I, needed, I needed a story that I wanted to see as a kid. You know, like I want my little seven year old gay self really would have appreciated this movie <laughs> is my hope and that's max and i we've heard a lot of uh gay men my age who have said the same thing like people say like i wish i'd had that when i was like 12. yeah you know and that meant a lot to us you know? yeah and you know one thing we also kind of reminded ourselves is you know this is just one coming out story i know there are a lot of coming out stories that aren't rainbows and unicorns and everything's happy and works out well right so everybody's journey through life is different everybody's experience in you know confronting something with with other folks is is not always the same and so um this is just this is just one 
one story. It's funny how the rainbows and unicorns can actually happen while you're trying to still sort out all this baggage, you know, throughout the process. So there's the the rainbows and unicorns are still there, but there's also still the 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 hurt and the sort of like the hiding who you are that you got to kind of keep pushing all the time and just trying to get yourself out there and more, to feel more and more comfortable with yourself, you know. Okay. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to take a moment to talk about Manuel. Um, one thing I, I, I sometimes hear POC say is that for them, th this this idea of coming out of the closet is it's it's not necessarily something that they experience the same way. So my understanding is that Manuel was based on an actual person. So can you talk a little bit about what he might have gone through? Well, I don't want to speak for him, but he's based Manuel is based off an ex of mine named Manuel. It was a very it was a real stretch to come up with that name, um, but he was another one. He was he's. He's more gregarious and out, and he's, it's like, cause it's part, I don't know if it's part of his culture or what, but he was much more out there than, than I was, you know, he's much more comfortable in his skin than I ever was, um, from the day I met him, you know, um, so I, I mean, I can't speak for people of color, but I just, it does seem from my experience, and that's all I can do is tell stories from my experience, which is why I made Manuel this person, it's like, that's, these are people that I know, you know. Greg isn't necessarily me, but he's kind of me. He's like, you know, 70% me, 70% a few other people, a little bit of Max, <laughs> you know. I guess I do see a little bit of a resemblance between him and Max. Totally, right? <laughs> You're adorable, Max. Look at you. You should see the guy who played, uh, did the voice of Greg. It's a uh, spitting image. Kyle McDaniel did an amazing job. Yeah, I'll do that and right now. You put a you put a hunter's hat on on him and there's there's Greg. It's ridiculous, but there's a lot of beard dudes in the Bay Area. So, what's all about? There he is, Kyle McDaniel. Where's the, where's the camera? Oh, there we go. Boom. <laughs> That's the actor play Greg. And fair enough. Caleb Cabrera, who did um, Manuel, his hair's a little longer, but damn. <laughs> So good. They were so good. So Max, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience working on this movie. What was it like for you? Ah, uh, man, this was this was a ride of pure joy. I've known Steve for a long time. I first met him um, Wally uh, on Wally. I was I had just started at Pixar and um, as a production assistant, and you know Steve was a supervising animator on that film and. I mean, I remember the first time I met him, he we kind of hit it off and he was like, man, we got to work together one day. We got to get you into the animation department. And um, we linked up on Incredibles 2 and um, worked together closely on that. And I knew he was kind of working on his own ideas and um, at one point kind of kind of grabbed me and, and asked if you know I would partner with him in making this film. And so, you know, I think creatively as a, as a producer, you know, you want to work on great films with great stories, right? But I think what made it extra special was that this was extremely personal to Steve. And it was humbling to me that he was kind of willing to open that door and, and have me help him make it. So, um, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about Steve and I learned a lot about filmmaking. Same, same here, man. It was amazing Yeah, uh, having you come on and just sort of like hold my feet to the fire when it came to the stories, making sure that it was, you know, it's, I, we were trying to find something very specific in the characters and that, but also finding something that was universal that could speak to a lot of people, um, whether you're gay or straight or whether you're just hiding something from your family or you just feel like you can't speak your truth. Those were things that I would want, I really wanted to resonate um, on, a, on a universal level in the story. And so having Max there to, to keep me true was really valuable. You know, for a breeder. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> okay, then. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, as somebody from the leather community, I have to ask, you know, something that's been really big is this idea of pup play, which is kind of uh, people getting in the headspace of being a dog and that being very releasing for people. And so I, I, I have to ask, it, w was that an inspiration for this? Is this an allegory for that? You know, what's amazing 
is that this is the very first time anyone has ever asked me that question. It's amazing. Like, I'm really, I'm really shocked. I'm really shocked. This has never come like, cause yeah, I mean, the story idea came out because I was, you know, I, I had an idea from it, the dog is based off of my dog and she was great. And I highly always wanted to do a, like some either a body swap or a mind control kind of thing with a dog and his gut and the, and the guy. So that was kind of there early on. But then as we were developing the story, I think at one point, Max, I was like, dude, have you been to Mr. S? Because they have these amazing leather masks that are all like dogs. And they have this whole pup plate, something. It's great. And at one point, I was in Toronto for at the Black Eagle in Toronto. And they had like the pup night where all the pups were on the, in the kennel on the floor. And all the dads were over with their beers. And it was just the most amazing. I just loved it. I was just like, wow. <laughs> like, I just... I love that there's something for everyone in this world. So I hope I hope they see themselves in this movie. <laughs> okay. The beauty of film and beauty of animation is you can, you know, everybody watches it differently and takes a little something different from it. So. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I also noticed that there's, I, I guess, the the dog and the cat that kind of show up and kind of frame the movie that kind of seems to have a very Twilight Zone-esque feel to it. Was was that a big influence on this? Yeah, um, Megs and Gigi, the, the cat and dog, the magical cat and dog, the out fairies, as one of our producers called it, um, they were modeled after my brother's dog and cat, Megs and Gigi. Um, my brother has a deaf pit bull. Um, and uh, she's just the most sweetest thing. But she would give you those looks, like just turn her head and look at you, like what's going on kind of thing. So that's where that, that acting note came from of the dog just kind of looking at the cat, like what? Um, but a lot of that really was to, um, I love Twilight Zone growing up. So it was like, I would, Rod Serling would always begin the episode, set up the premise and then move into the story and then uh, finish the episode. And it was always like anything, you knew that anything could happen in the middle, right? And so, there was that aspect of like, I want to play it the magic and weird. Like, you don't know what, what's going to happen here, you know, because you're set. Yeah, there's a lot to set up with the family relationships. But then when to, to get then get to get to the magic and you just want to get there without with the sh shortest of shorthand you can, can get. But a lot of it, too, was was I wanted to set up that this is one story like I want in my mind. I thought Megs and Gigi do this all the time. They fly down on rainbows. They go and help other people come out to who the, to their truth. Right. And my hope is that people could tell whatever their coming out stories are within this sort of framework, you know, that was, that's how I've always seen it because I didn't want it to be, I, I did I wanted this to be a, a coming out story, not the coming out story. Cause we're, there are so many, you know, whether you're straight, gay, I'm going to throw straight in there too. Straight, gay, trans, lesbian, right. There's so many, there's so many coming out stories uh, across the spectrum that need to be told. Okay. Um, so I know this was part of the Spark Shorts uh, program. And I, I'm kind of curious, do you feel like this is something that has enabled you to, to do more to, to have LGBT focused content? Sure hope so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I hope it doesn't stop just with the Spark Shorts. I'm, I'm hoping this bleeds into like features and, and, and live action storytelling as well. That we start getting more storytellers, more queer storytellers telling their stories, you know? And then, then it'll yeah, just yeah. come naturally. It won't feel shoehorned in or, or shoved, you know, shoved into a storyline. Uh, that'll yeah. come, it'll feel natural. Okay. Yeah, that's the, beauty of, that's the beauty of the Spark Shorts program and how it started, right? Is you have so many talented filmmakers across the studio from not only different personal backgrounds, but different departments, right? Like we had, you know, T, uh, simulation TDs who got to direct their film. Steve is an animator who got to direct their film. You know, we had um, one of the documentary the documentary directors got to direct a Spark Short program. And so it's this great opportunity for people from all over the studio, um, you know, finding new voices and finding new storytellers and finding new, new pipelines, right? New workflows. Um, so you can kind of do some visual experimentation too. Yes, yes, yeah. try new things. Yeah. It's like in filming at a giant studio. <laughs> cool. At a giant studio. So, you know, to me, obviously, like, gay media is a big thing. You know, we have stories that are marketed specifically towards gay people. Um, 
at the same time, it kind of feels like the 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 representation of gay people in other media is a little bit lacking. Um, we're we're definitely getting there, and so to me, this feels like kind of one of the the few mainstream representations of gay people that are are focused on them. Um, so I, I'm wondering if you can can go into a little bit more detail. You know, the, we we have a very big history in terms of representation of gay people in movies. So can you talk a little bit about some of the good and bad examples? <laughs> um, God, there's so many. I mean, it's just. I, I guess I would just want to speak to like, there's been a lot of talk about like inferring our identity in film characters and things like that. So that it's not spoken of in film. And I, I just think we, I'm tired of that. I'm really tired of it. I kind of want it. I just want to see more stories of ourselves, you know? And I just, I think there has to be more and more of that because we're not going anywhere. Like as much as some folks want, they, you know, they'd want us to go back in that closet and have everything go back to la some other strange la la land where we didn't exist. It's like, we we're here to stay and we need to tell our stories so that they know that and they get used to it and they see the humanity in it, you know, and that we're all the bloody same. I mean, let's get over it and just get on with life. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, and well, and, and just to add to that, right? Like, um, I think sometimes when audiences feel like certain themes are wedged in or shoehorned into something that doesn't really feel authentic, I mean, it's important that these stories come from people who actually experience those things directly, right? So if you get folks from diverse backgrounds in the writer's seat, in the director's position, that's when I think you're gonna get tap into some real, real truth and have it actually land in an authentic way and not yeah. feel as if it's, if, if it's forced. Yeah, we, we talked yesterday about um, the old guard that Charlize Theron movie had recently that just blew me away with the gay characters in that. I was just, I, I had to pause the movie and breathe and have a good cry and, and then continue on because it was just so unexpected, you know, and I, I'm not, I haven't done the research to find out where that came from or how that came about, but it was just shocking. It was like one of those scenes that you're just like, I, I didn't know I needed that, you know, I didn't know I needed to see something so goddamn romantic is so wonderful you know to see two men being like that was just absolutely jaw-droppingly awesome and i want to create more moments like that i want films that have those moments you know of things i hadn't seen yet that thought that in my brain i thought i had like it's somehow i see it was a straight movie with romance or whatever in it and i just kind of like fill in the gaps you know and pretend like oh yeah okay but then when you actually see it you're just like oh my god i had no idea i needed that you know Okay. So um, we also talk about, so I guess uh, Max hit on an important point there, which is the important part is making sure that we have representation both behind the screen and on the screen. And so even at, at this particular case, I, I still feel like this is definitely the tip of the iceberg. Um, so can you talk a little bit about like how you, you think we could go about getting more people uh, behind the screen that are uh, LGBTQ, who are people of color, women, all these things? Max? I mean, there's there's anything we could do that is just a true reflection of the world that we live in, right? Those are the best movies, right? Those are what connect with audiences, right? As, and and nobody, wants a, nobody wants to see a story from someone who doesn't carry any truth behind it, right? And so, um, you know, in this case on out and at Pixar, right? This, uh, it starts with a compelling, a compelling narrative and a compelling story. And, and um, they saw Steve as, a, as a, a great filmmaker and a great storyteller. And so at its root, you have to start with something that is compelling and interesting to tell. Um, and then it's up to the filmmaker to take it from there. Um, so yeah, you, you, it's it, in some ways, you know, when you look at larger studios, it's, it's kind of on them to, to tap some of these folks and bring them into the, into, into those positions. I think, we, I think it's our responsibility as filmmakers to like really be aware of what we're doing when we cast certain things. And there's always necessity. Like there's always a point like us casting out at Pixar, we're, we're the small fry and the, there's like giant films being made. And we're this tiny little thing that we can only pull what we can. And, we pulled some great people. Like we got some really great people. Where did, did I cast based on whether they were uh, part of the community? No, it was the best people I could, uh, that were available. 
Um, and they were all fantastic. Um, I just, I, um, I think I, you know, I think we just have to be aware as we go forward that if we're writing these stories and we, we got to fill it with people that have somewhat same experiences so that you're, your guide, the story is always being guided in the right direction for that story. You know, whether it's Black Panther and you hire well, black art directors versus like white art directors. I mean, like there's these things that, inf that the, your experience will inform the choices you're making on the film, you know? And so like when we were doing, um, when we got to the, the scene at the end of the, of the out with the kiss, I knew immediately we had to go get Wendell Lee, who was one of the oldest, he's been there as long as I have, we're the two, uh, the two longest, uh, I was gonna say longest lived gay, gay animators in the department, and I knew I was like I he, I had to go get him to animate the kiss just because it would mean something for the two of us to have been there for so long and to come out to ourselves and you know and he's got a family now like we've grown as as gay men over the course of our careers uh, at Pixar so it was really it was really emotional watching uh, watching him animate that you know and it was it was for both of us you know. I so, think that bringing that experience to it is what, like, I was able to go to him and I said, um, gave him the shot and I was like, okay, look, I don't want some peck. I don't want like a little, you know, kind of thing. Like, and I don't want him to be making out, but I want something right in between. And he showed it to us in a walkthrough and it was just the perfect, right? Matt, it was like this. Yeah. It was like a, Ooh, yes. Like it was, it was like just long enough. Like it was just long enough, you know? And I think that he got it. Like he brought that, brought that experience to it you know yeah so i feel like you know we, we live in a time still in in 2020 where 50 percent of lgbtq adults are in the workplace are not out of the closet and so obviously it seems like your ability to be out of the closet has helped you to be able to deliver things like this so i'm kind of curious what does it mean in 2020 to be out in the workplace what what can we do um to help LGBTQ people feel more open about themselves. Well, the other st the other stat too over the years is that like forty percent of runaway youth are like LGBTQ, you know, and and why is that? Because families push them away, because they don't see themselves as they don't they don't see them as people. They don't see them as their family. They see them as something other, you know. And I think the more stories we can tell and get out there into the world that people can see themselves in, then a um, see the humanity of, of the LGBT community, you know, like that's, that, that kind of stuff is important. And, and so us being in the workforce, being, you know, us, me working at Pixar, you know, a gay man working at Pixar, making a short like that, that has meaning for people out in the world. Like, you know, somebody out in the middle of nowhere, who's just got a whole bunch of biases suddenly is like, Oh, what, what Disney Pixar made a movie about this. What, you know, like circuits start firing. We can start, you know, I'm not saying we're the, the be all end all solution or anything like that. We're just the beginning. We're just, you know, people need to see more and more of this to get, to get used to it. Okay. So let, let's, let's look into the future. Cause, cause I kind of agree that this, this movie really feels like just the tip of the iceberg in a lot of ways. There, oh, there's so many more stories to be told, not just about gay men, not just about lesbians, but that we, we have a whole community and a whole spectrum of people that, that we need to be centering. So, Let's look a little bit into the future and see what do you think like a truly LGBTQ inclusive uh, media environment would look like? Oh boy. Uh, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, looking really far down the road, you don't even want to have to pre-qualify any kind of caveats to it, right? Like at the end of the day, we're making films. And, um, you know, one day down the road, you'd like that to just be it, right? This isn't a, this isn't a, a black film. This isn't a LGBTQ film. This is just a film uh, about humans and the world that we live in. Um, so, you know, and this is, like you said, we're, 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 we're getting there. Yeah. Yeah. You just hope that it's about. It's a, this is a film about love. This is a film about hate. This is a film about war. This is a film like, let's just get more stories out there. And we, the thing is, we've been around for so long. Like, we're not, it's not, we're not new, you know, like these, our community has been a part of human history. You know, where are those stories? 
let's go back and tell like stories throughout time that you know oh i read a great book uh the song of achilles uh about patroclus and achilles it was all told as a love story between them between him and his lover and it was just the most romantic wonderful thing you know and i'm like i want to make that as a movie i want to see that as a movie you know and not not what troy you know where they're pretending <laughs> like it's like not a love story kind of but not really yeah yeah definitely so what advice do you give to upcoming writers and animators that are from a marginalized community don't compromise on your story don't pull back like let it be true like speak speak true to your experience because that authenticity will bleed through like people can tell that you know and those are the stories we need right now you know the ones that are true the ones that are specific the ones that are about you i think that's that's important definitely i i feel like there's so much uh respectability politics we're supposed to sanitize ourselves and make ourselves palatable to a heteronormative world yeah likable no <laughs> no okay so can we expect to see greg and manuel in any more stories or <laughs> can we expect to see different stories i love this one this is like yeah that'd be awesome i would <laughs> like, what the adventures of mags and gg what's that i was just saying the adventures of mags and gg you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> so many it was like what or then somebody somebody else asked was like what's manuel's coming out story and i'm like i don't yeah i don't know like who i yeah. have no idea you know yeah but that's the cool thing right i think the subtle part, whatever it was it was just yeah. like mom look what i made you know i made it you know and she's like that's nice dear and went back to making <laughs> mole you know <laughs> but it was nice yeah. kind of like we, we it was great to hear people like oh man like yeah, where did what happened with Greg and Manuel, or what happened yeah, with when they move off the set? You know, and like you want to leave audiences in an uplifting way, kind of thinking, all right, well, what happens next? Where do they go? You know, mom and dad are jamming to the music at the end of the credits there, and um, you know, what's their story? And um, that's moving. Yeah. That's really like as a filmmaker, that's really touching because it's just like, oh wow, they they have lives now beyond us. Okay. So one quick question also, I noticed when I watch the subtitles, um, the mu it always notice, notes that the music is house. And I feel like that's kind of a genre that's kind of uh, been associated with gay people. Was that like a conscious choice? Because I, I know gay music when I hear it, but I don't know exactly what it is. Like, I we kept, call like, like, the, the we kept calling it, that. Yeah. what? No, I was saying we kept calling it like cosmic disco. Cosmic Disco, yes. Yes, Cosmic Disco. Pink and Purple, Cosmic Disco. Pink and Purple. Uh, for, for us, it was, we thought it was, I, I think initially it was just going to be like dead there. There wasn't going to be any music or anything. It was just going to be them floating in this weird space. But, and then Dave Lolly, the executive producer on it, he had the genius idea of like, what if we use like Justin Bieber? And we like, in the temp track, this is the temp track. And we like threw in some Bieber. And we, and then we were like, well, what, what if it, what if it was like, you're outside the club, like, you're out dancing and you go for a smoke and you're outside the club. And it's like that, like through the walls kind of quality to it. And then when uh, Natasha wrote the, wrote the piece for it, which was so fantastic and so much more seventies than, than we expected, you know, it was so fun to play that up. Yeah. Oh my God. I loved it so much. <laughs> Cosmic Disco. Okay. So what was the pitch process like to Pixar? Did, did they have any issues with uh, this being a story about gay people? Well, the nice the nice thing about the Spark Shorts project is the, the, the pitching process is a little different from the regular uh, films that they've done because it's sort of isolated and sort of given its own autonomy. Uh, you see, you get this freedom. You get a much smaller budget, but you're getting this freedom to create these ideas. So we were able to go off and kind of develop it on our own. And then it was a point where, when we were going to start moving into a production aspect of it, uh, where it wasn't just going to be me working on it. We were going to have to hire like an editor and a producer and all this other, like this kind of stuff. We had to like take it up to um, 
Pete Doctor, the chief creative officer, and Jim Morris, our the president at Pixar, and we went in their office. Oh, and the nice thing was, we found I found this out the day before they wanted to show. They're like, "Hey, by the way, tomorrow we're going to show this to Pete and and Jim, just so you know." And I I don't know if I slept much that night, but it was like one of those things where, okay, so we go in, we open the laptop, and we say we're going to show you a little film we did. And it was like, I had boarded it and we had like pink subtitles because I didn't have any voices, but I had music, like temp music running through the second act for the, for the beat. Um, and and I, we hit play and we just sat back and like, it was one of those things where you don't realize you're holding your breath until it's over kind of thing. But like, we're watching it and Pete and Jim laughed and everything and like, we're quiet at moments and then it was over and they were like, okay, great, keep going. And that, and that was it, you know, and it was nothing but support. And it, they had, they had notes. They, they had great notes as we went along. Um, and we addressed them just like we would on any other movie, but it was, it was pretty, it was pretty drama free, you know, I'd have to say Max, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think people have been eager to hear if like, we were like banging on doors, like we got to get this film made. And like, right. it was a huge struggle, but I got to say like, don't impress my kid. Yeah. It's the truth. I mean, like everybody at Pixar, from the people who just, you know, our friends and peers who we showed the film to, all the way up to the executive level, who are the folks who kind of approve this kind of stuff. There was never any point of questioning or contention. It was, it was, it was support, one hundred percent, all the way through. Yeah, yeah. Was there ever any concern that it, we hear a lot about? You know, places like China or Singapore editing gay content out of. Uh, movies was there did you ever feel there was any pressure for you to like make content that was palatable to those markets or do you get the feeling that this is just going to be chopped off there in the dvd or whatever yeah i mean they're gonna have to chop out the whole film what would you show in russia this one i don't know <laughs> it's like mags and Gigi. that's pretty i mean even the you'd have to cut them out <laughs> maybe just it would just be a film of a dog running around that's like that would be it <laughs> Um, I, you know, at some point I, I feel like Pixar is not that kind of place. Like Pixar has always been a director driven studio. Uh, it's all about what are the stories those directors are trying to tell and being as true as we can in telling those stories. Um, so, and if, if that, when it comes to those markets and that kind of stuff, I don't think you can limit yourself as a storyteller. Again, to go back, you got to stay true to what you're, you're trying to say. And if the world pushes back, then you push back harder. Okay. Um, so w tell, tell me a little bit about the, the breakdown. So, I mean, what, obviously this wasn't something that was made entirely by LGBTQ people. Um, how do you feel the breakdown worked on this? Um, like, wh how did LGBTQ people feel working on this? How did straight people feel working on this? Was, how was the collaboration between the two? Uh, personally, I, I felt this incredibly personal connection to everybody that worked on it. Like, they were every single person that worked on them, whether they were gay or straight, were just so absolutely supportive of the story and the film and me. I mean, like they were just they were just help. They were lifting it up the whole time. And so I never felt a weight of production on it. It was just always like they were there to help through the whole process. Um, we do have a, a, a group at Pixar, a Pix Pride group, similar to the Gaggles, right? Gaggles? Gagglers. 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 I love that. Well, yeah, well, so ours is Pix Pride. Um, and um, Matt Camello, who was our, our um, he, helped, he was helping us. In the, what's that? Yeah. He was a script suit. Yeah. Script suit. He uh, he um, helped us get the whole Pix Pride group together for a screening about halfway through the production. You know that there's a moment in the in the life of a film where you start to go, I'm not feeling this the way I used to feel. You know when I first started putting it together, and then you start to question every decision you're making. And then we got all the the group together about twenty. 25 people in the screening room, we showed the film. And it was one of those moments where you, like some, you know, uh, some people that I never expected to see cry were crying afterwards. And it was just like, okay, I guess this is working. And we had, and we got great notes out of it too. You know, like yeah. really great thoughts of how to make it better and support and support. Um, and, and it was just nothing, again, nothing but uplift from the community. You know, but so helpful to be able to show yeah. to, to have these groups to be able to to show things to to get to to help you with your authenticity of it was just uh, so rewarding. 
Okay. So let's talk a little bit. So do you, do y'all have any experience working with um, some of the other identities in the LGBTQ uh, spectrum? You know, we, we have bisexual people, um, non-binary people, trans people. Do, do we see any people that, that meet these identities that are, uh, you know, waiting in the wings so that they can also start taking on responsibilities, directing movies and making stories that are centered around them as well? I, um, it's funny. I, I've never been a social media guy, but then when we started doing social media for this movie, I was like, I got on Instagram and I posted a f picture for the first time in like eight years. I think the last time I posted something was me in a field in, in South Dakota or something like that. But, um, but then I, then I, you know, people, you start making a community again. And like, I see all these, and I'm amazed at how many young artists there are out there of every identity that are just hungry to show themselves, tell their stories, you know? So they're there. They need to be, they're the ones who needed to be lifted up now and be able to tell their stories, you know, that's, we need more and more of that. And I think the space is being made now. I think people are very into hearing or giving, giving these, this next generation of folks, the, the space to tell their stories, you know, I sure, I sure hope so. Even not, not, not even at Pixar, I just mean in general, like in the community, like in the filmmaking community. Okay. So, so what was the process y'all had of working together? How, how do you, how do you feel that worked out? Oh, Max. Man. God. I mean, this is actually part of the hardest. I mean, everybody is affected by what's going on right now with the pandemic and, um, Other stuff. I think the hardest part kind of like after the film was released in May, you know, we were finally able to kind of link up in person a few weeks later and, and finally kind of celebrate together safely. But I mean, you know, Yep. We got to know each other. We got to know each other really well on a personal level, right? And obviously, professionally, we we respect each other's work. I respect Steve so much as a storyteller. But like I was saying in the beginning, like we've become good friends over this, right? And yep. um, yeah, yeah. This been it's been weird doing this during a pandemic. I mean, we finished the film before it before uh, before this started, but then like we're like Max is saying, like we there our movie came out and that weekend, and we were like, well, what? That we're both sitting at home, and we're like okay, heck with this, let's go get some rosé and go sit up on Bernal Heights and have a toast, you know? Yeah. From some yeah. Street, you know, boop kind of thing. That was, that was great, you know? So, yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I believe we have some questions from the audience. Um, Can you talk Oops. about what it was like when folks at Pixar released the It Gets Better video? Were people nervous or full steam ahead? What is your most legendary Brand Bird story? Is that Brad Bird? Yeah. He is kind of Brand Bird, though. He is kind of his own brand. He is his own brand these he's, days. He's yeah. one of a kind. <laughs> um, I mean, in terms of the It Gets Better video, from my recollection, it was full steam ahead. I mean, yeah, the, especially in our community, you know, in the Pixar group, just being able to the, the chance to do it was just sort of like, hell yeah, let's do this thing, you know. It, my my memory of it, doing it, was I was I felt good talking, uh, and but I still there was still a part of me that was like, to go back to that whole baggage aspect of hiding who you are for half your life. There was still something strange doing it. There was still something very strange talking so publicly about yourself, you know. And that was several years back. And then now, now doing it with this film is definitely like sort of like getting expunging those those fears even more, you know. So I don't know. There's something there's something about the telling the telling of our stories that helps us get over this stuff, you know. What was the other, what was the other question? Part of the question. Brad Bird. There's like a thousand great Brad Bird stories. Steve, you. I mean, Steve, you worked with him for a long time. I I can't tell any. Yeah, he'll beat me up if I tell any stories like that. He'll totally find me and beat me up, or he'll have like some, he'll have like Tom Cruise or George Clooney at this point going and beat me up or something. Okay. <laughs> Were you ever afraid to tell your story? If so, how did you overcome that fear? Um, I had a voice in my, you, you know what it was? It, I had a, I I had a voice that just got. Oh yeah, you want me to tell my story? Well, I'm going to tell my story. Like literally, there was a voice in my head that said that at some point. Like I was just literally like, I am going to, fine, all right. Well, I'm going to tell a story. Then I'm going to 
know who to tell it. You know, it was like this pouty 12 year old <laughs> demanding to be seen, you know? Um, so that, you know, that's probably doesn't sound good coming from like a 50 year old, but <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> uh, it's surprising that it's 2020 and this is the first animated film from a major studio featuring an LGBTQ story. Did you get any pushback getting this made because of the story? Again, no, we didn't, there was no pushback because of the content of the story. Uh, uh, it was just the, the, it's our usual pushback of making the best story possible. You know? Yeah. Um, but as for, as for like, it being like the first and it, how weird it is, yes, that it is 2020, but it is. And it, you know, we somehow managed to pull it off weirdly. Um, and I, like, like Max and I keep saying, we said over and over again, we're just, we hoping that this is only the first. And we know it is like, this is like, there's going to be so many. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you know, there's no, at least at, at Pixar, there's no, there's no like checklist of the types of stories you're only allowed to tell. Right. There's, there's a couple pieces of criteria. Is it, is it compelling? Make them cry. Is, is it a compelling? Yeah. <laughs> Does it make you cry at some point? Is it a compelling story that is entertaining? And is it not rated R? You know, it's like, <laughs> it's, um, so there's no, there's no, um, I had, a, we had a rated R version of this. There's movie. no cap on kind of one of the, what the types of stories that you could tell. It just, you know, has to be authentic and true and reflect portions of the world that we live in. And, um, so yeah, I'd say the future is very, very great, um, in animation and beyond. God, it's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna be great. Hmm. See the future of LGBT. Oh, how do you see it? Like, I mean, again, just what are the stories that the storytellers want to say, and do they resonate with with us? You know, with all of humanity. Do they? I mean, they, there just has to be something in all of them that we just see ourselves in. That's what's going to be super powerful about it, right? Whether it's like, you know, I can't wait for the, you know. Again, I keep going back to the that old guard movie with Charlie Theron, but I want to see the story of those two guys. I want to see how like they're four hundred years old. How did they meet? Like I want to know. I want to see that movie, or I want to do the. I want to see the Alpha Flight movie. You know, where we get to see North Star's wedding. You know, that'd be amazing. There it is. Sorry, Another that was thing. me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. Um, in the making of your film. What was the most valuable piece of feedback that you received? How did that feedback impact the film? Oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah. That's tricky, eh, Max? Yeah, so there were there were there were a couple um I don't want to get too specifics into what exactly they were, but I mean, you know, there were I mean, we could walk through the multiple iterations of mom's speech that were written and you know gone back and forth and like really making sure that at the emotional climax of the movie um it's really hitting home in an, in an honest way right and that's what was so interesting and difficult about getting to where we got to with that portion is is it's not only it, we've been kind of following greg's story throughout the entire you know first seven minutes of the film and then you get to this point with with mom and you realize, hey, there's another there's another angle to this. Right. It's not only Greg's story, but it's also getting a glimpse into what it's like to be a parent who's going through this as well. And so I think that was not necessarily a piece of feedback, but just something that we kept wanting to iterate on and, and getting some input from others to make sure that we kind of landed in a, in a really great I mean, way. There was like support, like Mary Coleman, who is one of our um, executive producers at work, she, um, she was really supportive of what we call the pronoun, <laughs> you know, Greg saying, Greg's mom saying he makes you happy. There was, there was, we're, we're, we're visual storytellers. A lot of us rely, like Pixar is like, we're, a lot of our shorts don't have dialogue. We tell it through a visual way kind of thing. And that could be very strong, you know, but for that, whatever reason, this, this film, I was like, I, I want to hear that. I want, to, I want Greg to hear that, you know? Um, it was important to me and 
she and that there were some people that there were folks that were like hey what if you didn't have that? What if it was some other way of being? And, I, and she was like, I, I really like the pronoun. I really like that it's a surprise. It comes out of nowhere. And I love that the mom is, is aware of her son. Like she knows her son, you know, she just doesn't have, she doesn't know how to say it, you know, that's, and that's what the, the meaning of the story is, is that we're just trying to say our truth and it's hard, you know, it's hard to get it out. And we can talk to our dogs more than we can talk to each other, you know? Yeah. And so it was like to have that, to have somebody, vocalize that for you while you're sitting there um let's getting critiqued it was like it was like thank you thank you thank you you know like that's that means the world um there's like constructive advice like uh at the beginning of the film i had a i had um a scene that i had written where i was going to have the greg manuel at the beginning of the film manuel come out and they would be outside and greg would pick the dog up and as he goes in Manuel uh, would come up to him and give him a peck on the cheek and and then head inside. And Greg would like pull back and like look around the neighborhood and then go in the house. And Pete Doctor had, he was just like, I he's like, I don't want this to sound homophobic, <laughs> but like you might want to hold off on the kiss until the end of the film and have it be, that's your reward. You know, like that's the moment kind of thing. And it, and the more we talked about it, the more I was like, yeah. And I don't also like the idea of showing Greg that or like that so like so knee jerk sort of scared kind of thing there was something off about it so it's funny how you play these things and you you take these notes you take these notes and you have to like parse it through the truth of of that experience right and also the truth of the character and then the truth of what you're trying to say in the film um and again it all comes back to just making the best version of your story as possible um, and those are only like just a couple of notes that we got through the, the making of this thing. Yeah, there's some of the, so many. Our crew was so amazing that some of the notes came just internally from the you know 12, 13, 14 people who were working on the film and kind of keeping each other in check and knowing that hey, this is the story we want to tell. We know how we want to tell it. And anytime we stray from that, there was always somebody there to say, ah, 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 ah guys, we gotta stay choice, right? Uh, let's not take a shortcut or doesn't visually look like the mark that we were going for and so we leaned heavily kind of like on the amazing crew that we had yeah um, yeah there's so many i mean that's and that's not just true on our film it's true at every film of, at pixar that i've worked on because it's all about trying to plus up the film that you're trying to make you know so everybody's trying to bring the best ideas to it you know as we go like i would never in my wildest dreams imagine that mags and Gigi would leap off into the rainbow at the end and turn and be in like a flying squirrel pose as they go away. Like that just cracked me right up, you know, and that was Jen Megida yeah. just yeah. killing it. She killed it. Yeah. Made us laugh. Okay. Are there any elements that almost made it to the final cut of the film, but didn't? Why not? Why or why not? I think, I think I discussed a couple of those. Um, but I'm trying to think of like more example, like other, other things, Max. There were like different iterations on like what the calendar looked like. We had versions of oh. those that we kind of changed to make it, you know, gettable, but in the right way. There we might had... have been a version. Um, there might have been a version where Greg had something hidden in his drawer other than a photograph that would definitely make this thing rated R. Um, no matter how much we tried to hide it, it was good. It was like a, it was, it was sort of something like long and rubber. It was, I forget what it was, but it was something long and rubbery um, that he would find and have to hide from the mom and buried in the garden. But it would be, yeah. Anyway, um, there was that, there was things like that, or there was, um, Oh, instead of the calendar, it was gonna. I wanted to do, do a Tom Selleck poster in the bedroom. Uh, it was a Tom. I had this picture of Tom Selleck with his, he's pulling. He's opening his shirt. It's from the like the seventies. He's like pulling his shirt open. There's all this hair, and then I had Manuel had signed the poster like Magnum wishes, love Manuel, kind of on the back of it. And Mom was gonna find it, and then he rips that up. Um, but you know, Tom Selleck that costs money, and we don't have a budget for that. So, so we went with the fireman with the kitten. <laughs> Uh, good times. 
What resources are available for novice LGBTQ plus animators to find LGBTQ animator mentors? Otherwise, it can be it can sometimes be a daunting industry to break into if you don't see yourself in the majority. Yeah, that's true. I think uh, I don't know if there. I, I I'm a I'm a bad gay that way. I don't know if there are. You know, I don't know if there's a. Um, uh, groups that are. I'm sure there must be. There has yeah. to be. I, you know, I'm totally going to Google this now. Personal email is Stephen. No, I'm just kidding. Steve's personal email address is Stephen. Oh, yeah. yeah. Buy a at Pixar.com. Feel free to cut and touch. <laughs> Let's try something. No, but I mean Frank Abney, who was an animator at Pixar. He's uh, he they, they have a they have a, a great group for support for the within the black animation community. You know, like we need like that's great, and we need that kind of advocacy. Um, so maybe I, you're right. Maybe I should get off my butt and start advocating a little more or you could start it i mean we could like you know if you want <laughs> go jason was there ever an intention behind never saying the word gay in the film if there is forgive me no uh if there's an intention it was just that the character is scared to say it right like when he was in the bedroom and he's trying to get the words out uh, uh, you know he couldn't he couldn't even say the word to himself which that felt true to me you know, that felt true to my experience. You just kind of stumble around it, like stumbling around the word boyfriend or husband or anything like that. Like you just kind of, uh, like it's just weird, you know, because it's, yeah. it's just taught inside you, right, kind of thing. So it was only, if it was anything intentional, it was that. Um, that and Bob Iger saying, don't ever say the word gay. No, I'm kidding. He never said that. <laughs> he never said that. I'm joking. You know, you... you you say that, but like it, it, it's actually kind of funny, you know, how sometimes I guess this is kind of the, the factor of being in the closet kind of teaches you to avoid the word gay in a lot of ways. I just think it, 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 it you avoid the, the identifiers, right? The things that identify you, the things that call you out. So I think I think we just naturally when we're closeted, we just kind of stop ourselves from saying those things. And even when we're not closeted, it still lingers. Those, those feelings still linger like a phantom limb, you know? So it takes a while for it to get over with, or it takes getting married and gay married and gay divorced to help you get over it kind of thing. Never thought that would happen for myself, but apparently I needed to do that. Get gay married and get gay divorced. Huh. Fascinating. So is there a brain trust still used in the feedback process? If so, was it used for each of the Spark shorts? Yeah. Um, and the nice thing about the spark shorts is, and actually at the feature level too, I think, right, Max, like you, they kind of, yeah. kind of create your brain trust. As yeah. You know, like we pulled it's... in, like a, we had people that we pulled in and for various different reasons, you'd pull them in and have, we'd screen it for them and get feedback. Yeah. It's evolved. It's evolved over time. This concept of a brain trust of kind of pulling in folks from all over the studio to kind of hone in on some of the feedback has always been there, you know? It's evolved a little bit over time. We do have a creative um, approval team at Pixar, which is a small group. But but beyond that, I think and another great thing about the Spark Shorts program specifically is just what Steve said is you kind of have the freedom to assemble your own brain trust of of uh, of voices and and folks that you know you want to solicit solicit feedback from. So um, it's still very much used. Yes. Yeah. So it's not like an official group. It's just like. It's your, it's the people you trust to help you tell your story, you know? So if you can find a group of people that you trust, yeah, that want to help bring your version of your story, not their version of your story. Yeah. You know, like that's, that's what you want is those, that kind of group of people that really good, that hold your feet to the fire, you know, and don't let go until you, you know, yeah. Or take you out of the fire, hold you to the fire at the right times and then put you in Throw the fire. Throw a blanket over you and pat you out. <laughs> Thank you. So, Stephen, I think you've mentioned that uh, one of your influences was Harvey Milk. Um, do, you, do you feel that this is something that contributed to uh, your making out? Um, I mean, it was, I mean, he's been such a part, you know, in San Francisco, he's such a part of our community that, you know, is he plays the trail for these, for us. Like he's the, we're standing on his shoulders, you know, like the whole world is the guy, you know, and it was amazing to us when the day the film was coming out, Max was the one who pointed out that it came out on Harvey Milk's birthday. And it was just sort of like, oh, what? Uh. <laughs> like, yeah. that just we blew had me away. 
we had always kind of like talked about like, oh man, when when would be the perfect day for this film to come out? You know, yeah. Yeah. we kind of went through all a laundry list of great days. And then when the day finally was chosen and it was kind of like, like, like Steve said, we didn't really know. It just kind of, I was reading the news that day and I was like, oh my gosh, this is such, such a great kind of full circle little nod. Uh, great yeah. coincidence. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, I, I, I think the intent was that it wasn't going to come out until later in the year. And then because of the pandemic and everything, we started, they were putting it out earlier and we were just excited about that and got caught up in it kind of thing and didn't even realize it. And then it was like, oh yeah, it's Harvey Milk's birthday. We're like, what? That's crazy. Out and Harvey Milk were born on the same day. Oh. Stop it. You're well, going to cry. <laughs> I feel like there was, might have been a mismarketing opportunity had somebody caught that before or was that something you realized in retrospect? Uh, we, we realized it the day, the day, yeah, the day of pretty yeah. much. I don't yeah. know. If, I don't know if that was a, a, an intentional thing on Disney plus's part. Like maybe somebody at Disney plus was like, you know what? I have no idea, but I'm, I feel blessed because of it, you know? Okay. So, you know, Max, one of the things that we are least understood are, is the role that producers play. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, what your involvement in this was? Yeah. Um, you know, I, Stephen and I always talked about, like, me being a second set of eyes and ears for him throughout the entire process from, be from beginning to end. So, you know, being there every step of the way from, you know, script writing through through production and, you know, through working with actors and getting into animation all through the end, you're kind of there to, to like you said, kind of help maintain truth, make sure we're still on track creatively. Um, but then, you know, I'm also responsible for um, kind of staffing the team, surrounding Steve with the right pieces of, of other team members who are gonna support the story he's trying to tell. You know, I'm responsible for the budget um, the li liaison between our crew and the executive team. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a wide ranging kind of scope of work, but, but, you know, Steve's, no, Steve's whole, lot of, whole lot of dancing between the raindrops. It has to get done. Yeah. It takes a lot yeah. of skill. It takes a lot of skill, my friend, to do that. Where I'd be like, what? We can't do what? God, come on. Ah. Well, Steve breathes. Steve like, breathes. We'll find a way to do it. be fine. We'll find a way to do it. We'll tell you, I'll take care of it. <laughs> So, Steve, what did your parents think about this movie? They hated it. No, uh, they, um, they, they were like, "Is that me?" <laughs> there was a lot. There was a lot of that. That's for sure. Um, but they were really. I think they didn't. I did. They didn't understand it until they finally saw it finished. Like I had shown them an early version just to see how it was. I uh, there was a storyboarded version that I showed them just to see how my brothers and my parents would react to it. And a lot of that is like. You want to know how moms are going to react. So, like, let's find out how your mom reacts, right? And I don't think she understood what was what it was until she finally saw it. Uh, when we had a screening, we had all the family get together and watch it together. And um, and she was, she just was as touched as everybody else. She was just like, wow, like what? And she's like, that's just, she just felt it was really true. Yeah. What, what the sense of, oh, so that's what it was like for you. Yo, or, yeah, 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 and for her, you know. Okay. Um. So, do, do your friends also like this movie? Like, do you do you feel that that kind of rings true to their experience in coming out of the closet, or is it something that's a little bit more personal to you? No, I think most of the, most of my friends are. It's resonated for them. If they haven't, if it hasn't, they're not telling me. Those bastards. Um, but, uh, most of the, for the most part, they're like, it's, it's really landed home with them, you know, which is what we were going for all along, right. Is making sure that it's something that feels too, true to all our experiences, you know? Yeah. And even the folks that, even the folks that you don't know, Steve, right. I think some of the most rewarding kind of thoughts we would hear from fans or just folks that reach out, you know, through social and say, Hey, you know, I watched this movie with my kids and it like sparked this amazing conversation about, you know, what love is. And I'm so happy yeah. that Greg and Manuel ended up in love and lived happily ever after. So, 
Yeah. Now, those were some of the most rewarding things is hearing those conversations amongst families. Yeah, that is really good. I had a friend of uh, my parents uh, from over in Europe, and they were they they sent me a note about what their kids were saying, and it was like, "His good Greg loves Manuel," you know, like a little five year old saying that. And you're just like, ah, your heart just goes, Poof, you know, it's so good. I love that this generation is like, what's the big deal? <laughs> it just, it's amazing. Okay, uh, Steve, Max, it, it's definitely been a pleasure speaking with y'all. Um, I am definitely going to be paying attention to see what y'all work on uh, in the future. Um, it's oh. been great talking to you. Thank you so much, yeah. Jason. It's been really great. Really appreciate yeah. the time. And thanks everybody for tuning in and watching. This is this is super great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay.